If the ocean is the furthest frontier, then the ocean floor is a frontier beyond that. The ocean floor is a place where industry, scientists, governments, and advocates routinely do battle to explore, to exploit, to protect what's there. Oil and gas companies are seeking to tap mineral wealth. Scientists are documenting species and habitats that no one knew even existed. And advocates are, in the end, aiming to safeguard the space. I went a couple hundred miles off the coast of Brazil because one of these fights was unfolding. On one side, there was a group of three big oil companies. On the other was a group of Brazilian scientists. The drillers had paid and gotten licenses from the Brazilian government to drill in waters a couple hundred miles from the Amazon river mouth. And this team of Brazilian scientists who, unlike the Brazilian government, had access to a submarine, thanks to Greenpeace, had decided to use it to check the research of the drillers, specifically to look at what's called an EIA, or the Environmental Impact Assessment, which companies have to put forward to sort of prove that their drilling plan will not harm the environment. The scientists had an ace in the hole in that they had found out from conversations in the prior months that the oil company had put a drone in the water and had recorded footage of the existence of a huge coral reef five miles from the outer edge of their drilling block. Drilling companies were unwilling to release their drone footage or any of the scientific research that they had collected about its potential fragility to the drilling or to a potential spill. So the plan was for the scientists to go out with Greenpeace on a ship called the Esperanza that had been equipped with a two-person submarine to head out to where the reef was thought to be. No one had ever laid eyes on the reef. And now the urgency to do so was great because there were drilling plans nearby. The government of Brazil had said okay for the scientists to go out and put the submarine in the water. But shortly after we left, the government reversed course and threatened to arrest the ship and the team if they dove on the reef. So on board the Esperanza, there was very heated period, a lot of discussion as to what to do in response to the government deciding to block us. This reef stretches over 500 miles and one edge of it extends into Guyanese water. The plan was for the Esperanza, the ship, to head as fast as it could to that outer edge that stretched into Guyanese waters, which would put us outside the jurisdiction of the Brazilian government. I put the sub in the water there, dive on the reef, show the species that existed there. The problem with that plan was there was very limited time it was a long distance to travel. There was a storm on the way. The sub was due back for a next job in a matter of days. So a lot had to go right for that to work. Halfway there, the Brazilian government reversed course again. There had been a pressure campaign from allies of the Brazilian scientists and Greenpeace lawyers to get the Brazilian government to stick by their original stance, which was to let the submarine go in the water. Eventually, the Brazilian government said, fine, go ahead. So we headed back to the original site. We got there and we put the sub in the water. Yeah, so that's, that's, looking, that's looking better, huh? We have 10 degrees port rudder. We're making our turn to 033. We're almost there. We can go 15 degrees port. So we're turning around and going back to the position where we went to do the dive, but it appears like we have permission.
So this submarine is a two-man submarine, at maybe the size of a business class airline seat and packed with technology all around. And I went in the submarine with a guy named John Hosevar, who's the head of the Oceans Campaign Division of Greenpeace, and he has, uh, for many years, tried to convince me that coral reef are interesting and essential. And so we went in the sub, and a large crane lifts a submarine off of the helipad of the ship and then lowers you into the water. It feels a bit like a carnival ride, and it's sort of fun, at least it was for me, at least and, and it was until we hit the water, and that's when a certain panic set in for me. I think I went through three stages of emotions. The first was claustrophobia and kind of questions of, is there enough air in this cabin, and what if one of these gaskets blows? And the second stage was agoraphobia. As we went underwater and were completely submersed, you're surrounded by this strange blue. It's like being in a space that's a dream state. It's very open and you feel small and naked and unsure as to kind of where you are. The final stage is all very quickly as we turned on the engines and dove, we headed into this other world and you just have this, as all these fish pass by you, this incredible sense of awe that comes over you. When we got to the ocean floor, it was this vibrant, colorful world. John explained what I was seeing. The thing that struck me the most was this stack of rodolites, and they had been stacked about six feet high, and John explained that this was a cleaning station, and fish are regularly infested by small parasites, and some of those parasites can really do damage, and so these habitats emerge and the fish roll up next to one of these cleaning stations and all these little worm-like things board them, climb in their mouth and run up and down their body and clean them. This is what we were watching for a couple minutes. As we left the ocean floor, I guess I was struck by a couple of things. One, that not only was the ocean floor a kind of frontier beyond the frontier, and to some degree it's out of sight, out of mind status was part of why it remains so unprotected, but there's something more here, and that is that the species down there are often so foreign and sometimes even so small, and they are so distant from the world that we've come to understand that the public thinks about, that they are even more vulnerable. I guess I also sort of realized suddenly that to some degree what was at stake in this battle that was occurring between the scientists and the advocates and on one side and the drillers on the other was a battle not just over this habitat and its many species, but it was also a battle to slow down the extraction of a very mineral, namely oil, that was accelerating climate change and in so doing accelerating the very thing that ocean acidification to be specific that was decimating the coral reef population on the planet and so in the scientists attempt to push back and to document the reef the play here was about much more than just that reef it was about slowing down a practice in general.